Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to my talk, Life in Parents. As Kyla said, we will be making our own ecosystem with closure. So first, some words about me. I'm Italian. You probably can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> I have a mathematics background, and now I work mostly for Next Journal and Lambda Island, which you might know. So in 1859, a very famous book was published on the origin of species, which was revolutionary, not just because, well, the contents were also a bit known, but in there, the principle of evolution were codified, and uh, they are now the basis for evolu evolutionary biology as we know it even today. So just a few words about what are these principles. Uh, first of all, is realizing that um, population changes over time, and their characteristics also change. These phenotypes, so these characteristics, are expression of genes, and at every generation, these genes get passed on. And the individual within a, a population are different, like um, we're all different, like siblings even have, are different, even if they have the same parents, there are, and there are also mutations. And then the last bit is, I think, the simplest, but the most powerful, is that uh, there is a selection pressure that forces a population to change over time because uh, some of these characteristics which are good for a particular specimen are going to be uh, selected and some characteristics which are unfavorable will go extinct. And uh, here on the right we can see a small diagram about asexual reproduction, so one being uh, then there are three, and then you can see the light color gets selected out, so it's only the dark colors uh, continue as the successive generation of this population go on. And these principles are not only used in biology, but are also used in real life science. Uh, in this case, this is an MRI for breast cancer patients, so um, they, we want to try and get the images in the first column to uh, match the images in the third column to see if the cancer was successfully removed, but there are not exact algorithms to do that, or I mean, it's not easy. So what do we do? Uh, we create a population of candidate solution, and then we treat this as a biological process, and uh, essentially we let nature take its course. We, we encode like mutation, reproduction, uh, selection, and then after a while, you see, well, the third column is actually this algorithm has run. Uh, well it's quite an acceptable solution. So they are useful for uh, problems in which we don't know uh, exact solutions. But now about our ecosystem. Uh, the goal is to simulate one with three species. Food, which is a static resource. Uh, preys, you can imagine them as rabbits. Uh, and then predators, which feed on preys. And uh, interesting also, because we're talking about evolution, to monitor how they change over time, like to follow them and see if their behavior changes. And uh, we're going to build this together. So we'll start from scratch and we'll grow our own ecosystem. Uh, the choice of stack, uh, probably most of you know Quill, which is a library to use the processing language for 2D visualization in Clojure. And uh, we'll start by showing a quick Quill example. So this is the definition of a sketch, let's say a 2D visualization. And because we are using a functional mode or fun mode, uh, we have to determine three functions, setup, draw, and update. And we'll go through one example. So this is the setup function. You can imagine what it does. We initialize the frame rate. We set a white background. And then we initialize our state. In this case, it's just a vector with one point, zero, zero. Then in the update state function, we generate another random point between 0 and 500 for both x and y, and we conge it to our state. So our state is growing at each frame or each instant of our uh, simulation or our sketch, uh, and um, more points are added. And then in the draw function, we have to go from the state and use side effectful functions to draw them in our canvas. In this particular case, we will uh, partition the points in like series of two, consecutive series of two, and draw a line between them. And uh, this is the result. So you can see these are random points and they're connected by lines. And it's important uh, to mention that we are not drawing one line at a time. 
At the first instant, we're drawing uh, zero lines, one point, then we draw one line, then the drawing gets refreshed completely at every iteration. So let's start with our simulation. Um, I will omit a bit the code that we used to drawing, but they're just square, so it's not particularly complex. Because the main important about our ecosystem or our quill sketch is the state. So let's start with just food. And uh, we're just using nested maps, because we like maps. And uh, in this case, our food keys consist, or it's another map in which the, we have IDs and maps that contain an ID, the location of this resource. You can imagine it as grass. That's why I draw it green. And then a keyword to uh, help us distinguish what it is in case we, we mix them. Then we start to add our being, like these are the preys. And the preys look more or less the same, uh, except they have another key, gender. And uh, I chose very boringly pink for females and blue for males. But now they um, are not moving because we haven't talked at all about how we're going to change our state. So uh, I model the way the system changes based on a few, few things, a few key factors. I, I'm a really big fan of event sourcing, so I would like to declare these changes as maybe events. And then, you know, um, a certain McCarthy talked about situation calculus in which changes in a system, in a dynamical system, are modeled through effect of actions. And this is also the inspiration for the actor model, which, which maybe some of, some of us are familiar about. Uh, but it's not exactly an actor model, but it's, let's say, inspired. So we have that um, each of our beings will take an independent decision on what tentative action they would like to do uh, each turn. You can even imagine this as a board game, and each of the creature is deciding what they would like to do, so they declare their intention, and then we take all these intentions and we resolve them sequentially, and we compute the new state. So actually, our update state function looks like this. We have our praise, and we map the function take decision, and then we simply feed it into a reducer uh, which uses the state, as you can see, as the initial uh, state. So this is the main function of, let's say, or the most important function in our simulation, because now we can hear and code the behavior of this creature. Um, now, we don't really discuss anything yet, so let them, let them move randomly. And uh, I want to show you an example of like an action and uh, a resolver, if you want. So action is just a map. And it has three essential fields, type, uh, actor ID, and actor type. And uh, of course, it will also have a payload depending on the action that it is. In this case, the move action will just have a destination with an X and Y. And here on the right, you can see a resolver. And uh, I really like that enclosure. Of course, we have multi-methods because it allows us to, uh, in this case, it's dispatching on actor type and on the type of the action. So essentially, we can add uh, new actions and have change our system without too much cost by just adding a new implementation of this uh, resolve action uh, multi-method. And in this case, it's quite simple. The action is to move. You can see that we are going into the state. We are changing the x and y based on the destination of this uh, move action in the uh, keys of, of the particular uh, actor, in this case, a prey. So this is, this is how it looks. They, they are moving, but they're not doing too much. Um, I said they are moving randomly, but maybe Keen I will realize they're not really moving randomly, and I will get to that in a second. But let's first have them do something meaningful, uh, which is find food. And um, we implemented this um, as or another thing that Clojure has very cool is this OR statement in which you can have multiple clause and it will stop like the first true, uh, truthy uh, clause. So in, uh, you can, we can implement a lot of decision to be taken uh, in alternative and essentially they just need to either return an action or nil and if they return an action, we're fine. If they return nil, the next thing will be considered. So in this case, finding food is implemented as we look whether the creature is hungry and if it's hungry, you know, if, is the food nearby? If so, let's go towards it. Otherwise, let's search for food. 
And uh, it's also important to know that at the very beginning, we said these beings take a decision only based on their surroundings. So to also mimic what happens in real life, they have a sight radius. They only see a certain area around them. So how does it search for food? Uh, the first uh, basic idea is to move randomly, but that doesn't work out really well because we are searching for food where we don't know there is food, and then uh, we're going to move one square, and then we have one-fourth of a chance of going back, and we know there's no food there. So what happens is this, this creature move um, in the same area, and they die out of starvation. So we'll change this a little bit by adding the direction inertia, which means this creature will pick a direction, and then we'll do the next n moves, whatever value of n might be, in that direction. And uh, this value of n maybe is a good candidate for our DNA, because you can imagine a creature that has very high value of this n will actually pick a direction and stick with it and explore, maybe migrate. And this is, is an example of 300 steps for a being moving in our canvas. n equal 1 is a random walk, n equal 2. You can see the moves are a bit bigger, and it's exploring a bigger area. And 5 is bigger, and 10 much bigger. The total area of the canvas explored is much bigger in this, in this case. So now, uh, they are finding food, they're going at food, but they're not doing anything with it because, well, we haven't taught them how to do. Um, so it's time to implement the next decision to take. It's important, the or order, the order in our, our clause, because if we implemented um, eating, or in this case, interacting with their square, after finding food, well, finding food will probably uh, return a value, like, let's, let's go there, but we're already there, so it's not particularly useful. They will actually never get to interact with that uh, uh, spot. So we give there is an implicit priority in this action, and that's the ordering of these statements, this function in the OR clause. And in, in this case, interacting, um, we're only talking about food now. It's the creature is going to look at the first food that is in, in its place and just declare they would like to eat it. And that's what happens. Like, you can see they're moving, they go to a spot where there is food, they eat it, and they go along. But now we have to talk the first gotcha about actions, and that's why we have to talk about tentative actions or intentions, because there is no guarantee that an action will succeed. Imagine in this case, both creatures want to get to that food and they want to eat it, and there's only one. So what happens is what happens often in nature, first come, first served. Um, so we have to take that into account that there are maybe uh, ways in which our actions might not succeed. And in this case, uh, it's because there's competition. So now they eat, but let's also have them die when they don't have enough energy. So in this case, also die comes before interacting, because if the conditions are that, that you actually should be dead, um, there's no need to think about whether you can interact with your place. So. You can see here, now they move, and they die. A lot of them died. In this example, food uh, available was much less than the number of preys available. And you can see at the beginning what I said, that the selection pressure is useful uh, because it forces changes in a population. In this case, the population is adapting to environment in the sense that only a certain amount of uh, beings can be sustained by this environment. So eventually, well, in this case, it's very dramatical. But eventually, you know, populations adapt to the number of resources they have available. And imagine, if at this point we will increase the number of food available, then the number of uh, prey could, could increase. But in order for them to increase, we need to implement mating. And I generalize a little bit the fine food example about fulfilling desires. And in this case, they are going to potentially find food or find a mate. Um, this is just a simple example, and again, we use the NOR statement to show these two alternatives. And in this case, if they're both hungry and they want to reproduce, they will always look for food. But it's, um, it might be good to let them have the choice on what they prefer to do. Um, so actually, in the code of my simulation, I 
implemented a sort of priority vector of priorities, so they will have a preference on what they want to do. But now uh, we have two moving beings. They want to go uh, towards each other. And, uh, <laughs> and there is a problem. They're not going to find each other because they're, they keep switching places, what I call flip-flopping. Flip -flopping. Um, and it's important to note here that nature doesn't care at all about this behavior. I mean, if there is a species that exhibit this behavior, it will not be there for long because they, they will not be able to reproduce and pass their genes. But I have a little more limited resources than nature in my computer for simulation, and uh, time is short, so I hard-coded a rule to uh, avoid this. I mimicked, in a sense, what nature is doing. In, in many species, uh, the male has to do some kind of crazy courtship, crazy dance, and the female will just stay and watch and judge him. Uh, so you can imagine that's, that's what's happening. I implemented the rule that when they are close, the female will stop and the male will, will approach. So they made it, we implement giving birth, and this is it. Um, so they are moving, they are growing, they are reproducing. Uh, the red square is to uh, identify pregnant females, so we can take a look and see that more creatures are about to spawn. But you can see something is happening, like their number isn't great. It's, it's not going so great for these beings. Only two remain, only one soon, yeah. And He's fighting very hard for the survival. <laughs> and he dies. <laughs> well, that's nature. So this is another example. And um, it's going much better for these guys. Um, oops, a lot better for these guys. Uh, so much better than it's slowing down because my computer cannot keep up. Um, yeah, so it's important to note that both these examples uh, follow the same rules. So what is different about them? Um, parameters, actually. Because you know, I showed you how we implemented this ecosystem for now, but a lot of choices had to be taken. Like, how does it mean to be hungry? Like, how soon you are hungry? Like, how much do you want to reproduce? How many children do they do? Or like, how much energy do they get from food? How fast do they move? And how much they can see? And these are all good candidates for our DNA because right now, all specimens are still the same. So now it became the hardest part of this code uh, was like, you know, finding genes that made sense. I mean, those before were a good, uh, good indication. And uh, I sometimes try, th try to think about nature and draw inspiration from it. But again, I had limited resources. So I would like to have a nice ecosystem. Nice means not quick mass extinction and that my laptop can you know, process more than one iteration every few seconds. So um, it was also hard to find uh, how these genes uh, affect the behavior of these beings, because it's also, in nature it happens that something will be an advantage for something, but it will be a drawback for something else. And uh, try to code it, it's not that easy, um, because you will see like that's, uh, Everything is quite connected, and you move something, and something else um, falls apart. But I didn't mention at all predators. Uh, but you know that's not a big problem because predators are I'm almost identical to prey. But there is one difference: they are hunting, um, or I mean, they will eat moving things. So we have to implement hunting, and these poor prey have to have a chance of surviving. So we have to implement escaping, and is, in a sense, the, how it looks once the uh, predators are added to the uh, simulation. Um, you can see the light uh, brown ones are uh, dead prey because what happens also in nature is like predators can feed off carcasses of uh, other animals. And um, you are seeing here the blue and orange are predators, and uh, their number is quite increasing and the number of prey is not. So what's happening is also what might happen sometimes in nature. Um, predators are destroying themselves because, well, food is over in a second. There's nothing they can do. And they start dying. And they'll be soon extinct. 
So um, that's what I said before, is like small changes can affect completely an ecosystem. So, um, so we have an ecosystem, and at the beginning I said we want to monitor it and maybe you know, follow if the genes change. So um, we would like to m measure some quantities in our creatures and uh, monitor how it's going. If only I was working with a graphics library. I hope this works. So I made my own charting library with Quill, as any reasonable developer will do, like when faced with a problem. And um, actually, it was not particularly hard. I didn't make a full-fledged uh, charting library. I implemented just a way of visualizing uh, quantities. And it's cool because we can do it so by initializing an empty atom, and in every iteration of our simulation at the update function that we saw before, uh, we compute some statistics, and we just conj this, uh, the statistics to this atom. And then we create another Quill sketch, in which uses just DREF as the update state of the um, of its update state function, which means that every iteration is derefing the atoms. And now we have live charts. And this is, if the GIF works, this is how it looks. So this is very useful when developing, because then you can monitor live the environment. And the red line is the number of preys. The blue line is the number of predators. And um, well, before we saw the case in which predators completely destroy preys, uh, here we'll see, well, we saw the number that actually dwindled quite a bit until something I'm going a bit faster than the simulation. But, well, something happens, like a lot of preys were born, and their number starts to explode and grow. And normally, in this case, I have to just quit the simulation. Otherwise, that's, I mean, otherwise it would be still going. And yeah, it would reach a point in which the population will be stable, because the quantity of food is uh, finite. But uh, I didn't have time to just. So let's see how some of these genes uh, evolved over time. This is, of course, just a particular run, but I've tried to uh, make some observations that, are, that I observed, let's say, consistently throughout several simulations. So this was the gene about competition uh, threshold. So I encoded a behavior in which sometimes a praise, um, specifically we're looking about genes of praise. Um, the behavior in which preys sometimes, if they wanted to get to some food, but there were already other preys nearby, they will say, like, no, too much competition, going somewhere else. And this number is how much is too much. So um, it turns out that this gene is increasing, which means it's actually good for these preys to fight for food with others. So they will say, even if there are other six preys around it, I don't care, I'm just going to go for it. And apparently, um, it's convenient to do so rather than to give up, because if you give up, you still have to look for other food somewhere else. Something that was surprising, I thought this gene was clearly advantageous, because that means they can extract more energy out of food. So definitely, specimens that can extract more energy will have an advantage. Surprisingly, it doesn't matter. So there are other things that are more important. Uh, this was another gene that expressed how long it is the childhood, so how long period of time they spend without looking for a mate. And it turns out, actually, this increases a bit, or at least it's convenient to have a value bigger than the one I initialized it with, which means maybe at the very beginning it's good to not be distracted and just look for a lot of food. This is something that was surprising and is leading me into thinking like I didn't implement these decisions very well. Uh, because this is the site radius. The higher this number, the farther they can see. And they would expect, well, if you can see more, you can take better decisions. Turns out it's the opposite. So if they can see less, they are less distracted. Means they don't really have a good criteria of choosing what to do. So something to be improved. And again, also, this is the litter size. We and could uh, imagine this going up because the bigger, the more children they have, the more likely is their DNA to survive and to propagate. So these genes are more likely to be selected as we go along in the simulation. And uh, once again, um, this is not super clear behavior, but uh, uh, this is the energy threshold gene. Means 
how does it, what does it mean to be hungry? How quickly you are hungry? So the higher it is, the less they can survive without food. That they, you know, they have, you know, probably nervous eating or something. And the lower it is, they can resist more. And um, well, it seems they haven't made up their mind what what they want to do with it. And this is also another clear gene which was. Um, which gave the uh, specimen a competitive advantage because as happens in nature that there are, um, think, think about, I think, mice, like they have uh, quick pregnancies, but they make a lot of children, compared with elephants where they have very long pregnancies, but they make only one child. So I tried to mimic a bit that, saying like the longer the gestation is, not about litter size, but the longer the gestation is, the more energy uh, will have their um, child and it's better to have longer gestation. So your children have more energy and more chance of surviving. So about to round up, like Quill is great for interactive programming. I don't know how much experience you have, but I have to say that it works really well with the REPL driven development uh, that we love. And especially it's nice to hack on the system while it's running. So I, if I were to start the simulation now, I could change the code saying like, what's the gender of children that when they're born, I will say now, from now on, only females. And you will see only females popping up. No need to restart anything, just to reevaluate the function. And then, so you could alter it. And if we add that plus live monitoring, you, you can have some fun and experiment. And um, it was really fun to develop a game, a simulation, visualization. And I encourage everybody to do it because, I mean, we like a lot uh, fast uh, feedback loops and what is faster than just coding and seeing something a few minutes after. Uh, there are many frameworks, not just Quill, uh, Play CLJC, uh, which I think there is another talk about this today, uh, Closure Lanterna to actually do roguelike in the, ad in the terminal, Closure 2D and other 2D libraries. And we experience also that the Tamagotchi effect is somewhat real, like before we had one guy that was really trying very hard to survive. So we, you know, you tend to root for these things. <laughs> it was very fast, but yeah. And about this um, biology aspect, in a sense, um, I realized that really minor changes can have an extreme effect. I really had a hard time balancing this ecosystem. To be honest, I couldn't really get it under control because what happened is like, up until there were preys, it was somewhat reasonable. But when I added predators, uh, mayhem, because either the predators will just kill everybody and then die, or they will just die off and the prey will just multiplicate exponentially and uh, the ecosystem will just explode. So it's uh, the more realistic you make it, the harder it is. I really wanted to uh, reproduce this chart you see here about lot cavalter equations, which are uh, ordinary differential equation you can see like on the bottom right with mice and cats um, that describe actually population of prey predators is also known as prey predator model and you can see like there is also a feedback loop between these two populations because as the prey increases there is more food so predator a population can increase but they eat more so the population of prey decreases and there is less food for them to eat. And they sort of uh, bounce each other and make a pattern like the one we see on the top right. Um, but I couldn't, because it's really hard to get something balanced. And I have to say, I have a newfound respect for nature, because we see many ecosystems which have not just two, three species, but they have tens of species with very complex behavior. And uh, just a little bit uh, changes, the, the ecosystem will be disrupted completely. I think it was in uh, Australia where uh, rabbits were introduced. A uh, few of them escaped, a few couple of rabbits escaped. Now there is a rabbit problem in Australia because there is no predator for them. So imagine in this ecosystem I introduce a new super predator which kills uh, prey and uh, predators. Uh, the, the ecosystem will be differently, maybe more balanced, I don't know, but uh, Possibly. And um, yeah, that's it. That's, that's, that's what my talk. Yeah, thank you so much, Davide, for this demonstration. Are there any questions? Yeah. So, uh, I, so you're modeling um, uh, 
uh, genes and, and this behavior at the level of uh, parameters and mm -hmm. range of values. Yeah. Uh, but have you thought about modeling them at the level of code, like S expressions? Yeah. Yes. I mean, it would be cool. I mean, uh, definitely with uh, with uh, closure or any Lisp, we could do anything like this. It would have taken a little bit more of time, but uh, definitely uh, something uh, we could definitely do is have give them a framework for learned behavior. I mean, this is what nature does. Like nature doesn't have to code almost anything. Uh, has yeah, specimen can improvise and learn a behavior or through several generations. So. Definitely is possible. Um, a little bit more complicated than this one. Cool. Uh, is there any more questions? Yes. Hey, thank you for the talk. Um, this reminds me of a paper um, uh, in the Erlang space that I read a while ago where the setup was similar, but it was completely based on actors and parallelism mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Um, so you, with, with the flip-flop effect, mm -hmm. that seems to me that um, all of the actors, like it's step-based and then everyone sees what happens before and then, and then and what, what, what was happening before the step and then... Um, yeah, each, yeah. Uh, each being cool. will make the decision based on what it's there now. Right. Um, how... Uh, do you think you could fix those things um, by making it sequential in that everyone knows what the people... Yeah, what no, it could be. Okay. I modeled this in this way for uh, being able to compute all of this in parallel. Right. So um, that's why I did it. I mean, if you want to do it this in parallel, there is this trade-off. But of course, if, if it was sequential and like in a board game where you know, you know what the other people have done this turn before you, then yeah, definitely that will, that will solve completely the flip-flop because, oh, now you are here, I don't need to do anything. Right, yeah, that's why I brought up oh, the yeah, yeah. thing as well. Because no, it's true. Same thing. Cool, and I think we have time for one more question. You wanted to? Cool. Uh, thank you. Nice, very nice simulation. Did you have a look at the uh, distribution of the different genes, and if you maybe get something like different populations? Uh, ah, different clusters, or what do you mean? Yeah, it might be that like one subset of the, um, let's say, the prey goes into this direction. Like mm -hmm. you know, a certain value increases, and for another, it decreases, mm -hmm. and you get like basically like new species. Yes, yeah, separate species. Um, no, I haven't. It's a good idea. Uh, I do think the time is not enough to see um, separation of species. I mean, definitely, I mean, the, the bottleneck was how big the world is. Like, if I was optimizing this a little bit more and a bigger canvas and whatnot, definitely that could be the case. But I think with the small world that I created, it will, they would over, uh, I don't know, cross over very easily. And then, so not enough time to have separate population evolving independently. But yeah, that's, that's what happens in nature, no? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for your questions and give another hand for Davide.